Hi, welcome. Uh, my name is Josh Cooperman. I'm the host of Convo by Design, a podcast for the design and architecture industry. I also host Doctoring Up Design, which is the design hardware uh, podcast. Thank you all for coming today. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm excited about this topic, uh, not just because it's important, but because the idea of wellness, sustainable design, water, it, it's, all, it's all tied together, right? And I think you're gonna, if you don't know this esteemed panel, you, you will by the end of this. I'm really excited about this conversation. So what my hope is, is that by the end of this conversation, we have an opportunity to think a little bit differently about the environment as it relates specifically to how we build, why we build, what we build, right? With that, I'm gonna start on the end and ask uh, my guests to introduce themselves, and we will go from there. Uh, my name is Cassie Aliagi, I'm president of Form LA Landscaping, and we are. We have seats. Up, we have seats up front too. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so our landscape uh, company specializes in design, build, and maintenance, and customizing native landscapes that are appropriate for LA's climate throughout Los Angeles. Um, and uh, we believe that we're setting an example of what could save the world, or even if it's just LA, that's okay. But that's what we're doing for our landscapes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ben Stapleton. I'm the executive director for the U.S. Green Building Council, Los Angeles. Uh, we're an independent nonprofit, so we're affiliated with the Green Building Council that runs the LEED credential and certification that you may know and, and hopefully love. Uh, but uh, we're independent financially, independent board. Our mission is really to leverage the built environment as an entry point to create a more a sustainable region for all here in Southern California. And we believe that everyone can be part of that process. Uh, the issues we're going to talk about today around uh, fire, around water, uh, native plants, ev everything is, a, is really core to, to what we do uh, because it's all interconnected. So really happy to, to be on this panel today. This is my, my second time being here. I just realized I thought it was maybe last year, but it was February of 2020. That's what a pandemic will do to you. Wow. So, good, good to be back though. Thank you. I'm Tim Barber. I, I founded a firm about 30 years ago of uh, architects who focus on single family residential. And you can imagine uh, in this community that usually means uh, uh, for the well-off. And I think, uh, the reason I think I even got invited to this panel, it has become my team's focus to, uh, to advocate at every point for all kinds of sustainable features from solar collectors to gray water systems so that um, especially our clients who can afford it and who might actually have the, the inclination to do that know every possible tool they could use to make their, their lovely residence sustainable and a contributor to the community. So that's, even though you would think, oh, what's an architect doing up here? I think I'm here because that's really become our focus and we're, uh, we're making strides. So thank you for including me. Hi, I'm Lee Gerard, president, uh, owner of Greywater Core. We are a company that designs and installs mainly residential gray water irrigation and rainwater harvesting systems. We've been around for about 14 years. Uh, I used to work as an architect, um, now uh, took a left turn, and this is all we do. So we're the boots on the ground. We're actually figuring out how these systems work and how to install them, and we've got the team that goes out and does the installations. So I thought, <clears throat> excuse me, I thought to sort of kick this conversation off, I, I, would, I would just share something briefly. It's all about perspective, right? Um, I'm working on a design house project. I'm a native Angelino, born and raised here. I'm working on a design house project in Tulsa, Oklahoma. In the Midwest, they're not talking about this. They're not talking about sustainable design. Not only are they not talking about it, but they've never talked about it um, because they've never had to. In California, we have to. And you know, I remember years ago where it was kind of a whisper, and now it's a scream. And with that, you know, Ben, I, I kind of want to start off with you because, you know, as a thought leader in the industry, where, where are we now? Where, what is this, 
we hear the reports. We, we know the, the issues with water. We know the issues with fire. I remember when I was a kid, there was a fire season. Remember that? If you're from LA, you, there was a fire season when there would be fires. But now it's year round. Um, what is, in, a real, in the most realistic, no hyperbole, what is, the, what is the state of the environment right now in California? <clears throat> that, is a, that is a big question. It's a big question. Uh, you know, I think it's interesting for me because I work in this space and I'm, I'm an optimist by nature, uh, but we have to keep in mind that emissions are still going up. Emissions still went up last year. They're going to go up this year. They probably will go up next year. We haven't hit that, that peak yet. And, you know, what does that really mean? That means that this is going to be the struggle of, of our lifetime, of our generation. Um, and I think it's really tough to kind of get lost in that struggle, especially as we think about everything we've experienced with the pandemic over the last few years. Um, you know, we see data on temperature increases and what does that really mean? How does that affect me? Uh, and I think it's just important to remember to be human throughout this experience. Uh, it's really about just creating a better life for ourselves, for our families. Uh, and struggle is part of being human and it's about connecting with other people and learning how you can make those improvements around you. And, and I think. Awareness and education is really key to this because once we learn things, we don't tend to unlearn them. And so we really, really focus on getting the message out there. I think everyone needs to be an advocate. Uh, and when you talk to that homeowner in the Midwest, when you talk to that neighbor down your street, you know, take those opportunities to say, hey, have you thought about this? You know, have you thought about that? And it's really about taking an intentionality. You know, we talk about issues around fire and water. You know, we can go about these things if we're intentional from the very beginning of trying to preserve the resources we have, trying to reduce our risk, but it takes that kind of approach and it takes the education to get there. And uh, the reality is, you know, to answer your question about the environment, it's going to continue to get drier here. It's going to continue to get hotter. Uh, we need to prepare ourselves. Um, you know, this isn't about the planet so much as it's about humanity. Are we going to be resilient? Are we going to adapt? Are our homes going to be able to adapt? Are we going to be able to preserve a lifestyle that we feel like is worth living? Especially here in California, we have so many people and um, we've done so many great things as a state to really lead the, lead the country and lead the world. I think we have the opportunity to leverage the resources we have here, whether that's thought leadership, whether that's money, whether that's media and Hollywood uh, and policy, whatever it is. I think LA is in many ways kind of a microcosm of the world. This is our opportunity, I think, to lead and embrace this challenge and show how things could be. Uh, and that's the moment I think we're at here in California. I think, you know, we're, we're sort of, we've entered the trenches, right? To your point about wildfire, you know, there was a few years ago, you'd ask people, about it's like, oh yeah, it hasn't really affected me. Almost everyone knows someone who's been impacted by wildfire now, uh, whether it's a family member or a friend. These things are going to continue to happen. To your point, it was a whisper a few years ago. Uh, you know, the universe whispers, then it, then it speaks, then it yells. Uh, we're kind of at that point now. And all these things affect California in a very unique way, but this is our opportunity, I think, to embrace that and to be leaders and accept that challenge uh, moving forward. So let's start outside. When, when you think about designing exteriors and landscape, clearly the thought has changed, the ideas have changed. How has the business changed for you? How has the design changed for you? Um, I would say the design for us, our company, hasn't changed so much because we've been doing this for 25 years, but I think just kind of pulling off of some of the things that Ben said, um, that you know people, um, innately want to do good and I think that when you have set up the education and awareness around how impactful a landscape can be not just to your own site but to your entire neighborhood to the school district to the value of the homes in that neighborhood and even beyond into um, neighborhoods that are in need of more foliage I think that when people are educated and aware that they realize that these little choices have huge impacts in overall climate change and our resilience and um, everybody should have a piece of that in Los Angeles, not just um, people that can afford it. Talk about the materials though. And I, and I say that because you know anyone who has been to Phoenix, mm -hmm. Vegas, Palm Springs, you can see over the last 10 to 15, 20 years how it has changed. I mean, the lawns in Palm Springs were gorgeous <laughs> 25 years ago. Yeah. You, you see things change. 
Yeah, and actually, if you go to Palm Springs, it hasn't changed very much. But in Los Angeles, you you, you do see some things change. Um, uh, what I've seen is this idea that um, Los Angeles is a desert, and and maybe I tend to be more a little bit more technical in science. But you know, technically, we're a Mediterranean climate, and our native palate isn't made up of that many cacti and succulents. And so if we have a little bit of a better understanding of what a native plant palette is, then we can bring the right materials to the site. We can leverage the microclimates on the site, whether it's a you know, multi-housing, a large development, or single family residential, we can place the right trees in the right spot for shading and energy savings and uh, cooling all and water conservation, all of these things. The plants sort of are the magic in the materials in, in the landscape and they are only, um, and they are highly underutilized. The building actually, you know, is the, the carbon producer, <laughs> the plants, the materials in the outside are the things that help offset that. So, we continue to undervalue uh, what our landscapes, what our landscapes are possible. Okay. And I think it's surprising too, because look, here in Southern California, we're the we're the crunchy granola type. So you know, Laurel Canyon in the '70s, outside in, inside out. Um, I've always felt like Southern California was really that thought leadership base for the idea of wellness in the home. And what we're talking about really, I, I think it goes hand in glove with the idea of designing good and designing well at the same time. And you know, Tim, how has this affected your thoughts and views professionally and personally as it relates to the design inside and out? We weren't always as focused on sustainability as we have been. But from the very beginning, we insist on having a landscape designer who loves trees in our projects because half the time, the way the building needs to be oriented or shaded because of sun or wind pattern or, or even the drainage pattern, uh, we know that we're causing trouble. You know, the, the building is interrupting the natural environment in some way, so getting that synergy with the landscape designer with, for the trees or for the swales or for some way to capture and hold water runoff has been something we've always done. What we've learned to do, uh, I think several of us got lead credentials about 10 years ago and we've uh, we also we did a, a lead gold house a few years ago. Not that I would do that again, but I think that <laughs> what we learned uh, about materials, um, everything from low flow toilets to aerators to the, the new California codes on shower controls, um, solar collectors, um, gray water systems. I, I found Lee about eight or nine years ago, maybe. Uh, and uh, maybe I should say, I'm kind of a tinkerer or a, a mad scientist. I, I try a lot of things that I want to spring on our clients on my own home. So I had Lee do my house a long time ago, and we tinkered a little bit, but I have had a gray water system, a laundry to landscape, no tank, no pump, no filter, just a passive system in my own home for eight years, and uh, adjusted it a little bit. I have a, an orchard for a yard, and so we've been bringing Lee to the table on different projects, sometimes for more sophisticated projects than that, but the way we've learned is partly about materials, partly about collaborators, and really more about um, the the increasing crisis we have. You know, just the, the, the snowpack and that, like the, I think we've had six inches of rain in the Sierra Nevadas this year. That's, that's a crisis. And so as we learn more about that, I think we're looking for more and more tools, especially in terms of water reclamation and reuse. And Lee, sort of jump up, take the, take the ball and run with this too, because I think it's important. It's, it's not an end all be all, right? But it's, it's an idea. Right. I mean, when you think about the infrastructure of the state of California, we are getting our drinking water from sources hundreds of miles away, Colorado River and the Sierra Nevadas. Water is pumped hundreds of miles over mountains, across deserts. It comes into our house, runs over our hands, and then goes into an equally Byzantine system of uh, pumps and filtration and aeration and settling tanks, and ultimately just goes out to the ocean. 
So there's this double waste. We're spending a fortune to get the water here, and then we're polluting the ocean by sending it out. And in a typical residence, there's one source of water, drinking water, that comes to the kitchen, to the showers, and to the irrigation of the plants. So what everyone around here is doing is irrigating their plants with drinking water and letting perfectly good water run off to the ocean. So that's kind of the, the root of how I got into this. And you know, I think maybe the systems I love are the low-tech systems like we did at Tim's house, where it's just gravity flow, no tank, no filter, no pump, um, and just getting water out into the land. And even if you're not irrigating with 100% efficiency, you're doing this critical work of getting water back to the water table instead of the ocean, where it does no one any good. With voting, um, we have to use special soaps um, that are low salt, for example, but that should be a trend for even systems that go through our sewer system. But there's no reason to have this kind of soaps that we have that would really make it hard to recycle the water, even if we are sending it to the ocean. But what if we were sending it to area public parks or something? We should make a stronger case for what you talk you need to do. Hey, Ben, what's the, what's the primary barrier here? Is it education or is it availability? It's an interesting question. I, I feel like the awareness and the education drives the demand, which over time will increase availability and reduce cost. You know, there's always sort of the carrot and the stick, right? You know, and, and uh, luckily here, you know, policy, you know, in California, in LA, continues to move forward. It's sometimes not as fast as we'd like to see, but we also, I think, have to keep in mind that in many ways we are leading the rest of the country, and we are always trying to find that happy, happy medium. Um, but you know, it's. I think the challenge is really creating that awareness and, and look, people don't care, unfortunately, unless they have to, right? And I think with what we've experienced over the last few years with the increasing impacts of climate change, there's a dawning realization that, oh, I, I have to care, I need to care. You know, we enter a, a water crisis like we're in now, you know, the city's done a good job in some ways of reducing water use. Um, it's arguably not enough, but we've made progress over the last couple months. It's because people are, are seeing that noise, understand that they have to care. I'm starting to hear friends of mine sort of shaming each other for watering their lawns. And, you know, there's this cultural element that we need to embrace, uh, and that's really important. And, and, you know, policy here in, in L.A. is going to continue to change. You know, starting next year, there's going to be, you know, no, no natural gas hookups for new development. Uh, there'll be exemptions for commercial restaurants and exemptions for labs and some other special uses. But, you know, part of the trade we're making with people who the pipe fitters unions and the others who actually build the pipes to bring in the gas is that we're gonna start mandating gray water for, for uh, any building that has a certain amount of uh, volume of flow in it. And so this stuff's gonna happen and people will go with it because they, they have to, um, but uh, you know, it, it's complex, right? You know, human beings are complex by nature, but unfortunately we just don't do things until we, we have to, or we feel like we have to because we care. So it's, it's interesting, I wanna challenge that assertion a, a little bit, that people don't care unless they have to, right? Which kind of leads back to it's the chicken and egg, right? Which can is, is it education or availability? I think, and I feel like all of these ideas are inextricably tied back to wellness, right? Clean water isn't isn't something that you do it because you want to. You do it because it's good for you. It's it's it it makes you better. I think if we've learned anything over the past three years coming through this pandemic, I think we are now in a renaissance in the home design architecture industry. I think we've all learned that our homes didn't function the way that we wanted them to or the way that they should or even the way that they could. Is it, is it one of those things where, and again, back to materials and outdoors and landscapes, because I feel like that's where it kind of starts, especially for this conversation. And by the way, one of the things I want to point out before I get into this too far, if you look around the showroom, you will see products with a fire and water sign on them. Um, I would encourage you when we're done to talk to Michelle or any, anyone on her, her team here at Design Hardware um, about these products. I think it's, it's the education and availability where products are available. Remember years ago it was the low VOCs, it had to be low VOC. But then we've learned it's like there's so much more we can do. When it comes to wellness and design that's tied into environmental impact and issues, 
how does product, how does education, what are your clients asking for now that maybe they weren't asking for years ago? Well, it's interesting just to maybe uh, re-characterize what I see Ben's comments on, on the challenge that you asked and, and then answer your question if I can bring it all together. But I think that um, what happens is policy is reactive versus proactive. And so that policy frames the way the messages go out. And that frames what people ask for. And what people are asking for isn't necessarily what benefits them or the community or the globe the most. And so I think as professionals, um, ambassadors in the community, it's up to, up to everybody to get ahead of that reaction, realize that we're not, we're not a one focus issue. We need to be using materials, design approaches, products that, that address the entire uh, spectrum of issues. Um, for instance, water and drought isn't a singular issue. It's not not related to fire, it's directly related to fire. If we don't, if we're dry and hot, we're going to have more fires. If we're landscaping and using the right materials and bioswales to uh, infiltrate water and cool the environment and mulching, we're going to have uh, be landscaping more defensively against fire. So I do think that uh, you know maybe back to the chicken and egg. I think that it's up to people that have the information and can leverage maybe. Uh, you know, or, or realize that there's misunderstandings about the way these messages are going out. If I could maybe just build on her comment for a moment, because I think there's there's systems issues at play here, right? You know, for, for water as an example, yes, we all want clean water coming out of a tap, but you know, right now, that cost of water is highly subsidized by federal funding to put systems in place over the last hundred years, and so we don't pay that true cost, so we don't value it the same way. You know, I've worked on projects that saved millions of gallons of water and had owners not do them because it just wasn't, they had other opportunities for that capital that were gonna generate more savings, right? And so, you know, that we're gonna see water prices go up in, in the near future. You know, we have systems in place to protect water quality, but that's when I come back to people didn't have to care, as that cost increases, people will care more, and we've seen that on, on the energy side as well. Uh, and it's the same thing, you know, when we talk about fire, again, that's ever present for us and there's changes in, in, in insurance regulations. They're starting, there's gonna start to be disclosures and there already are and you're in areas that are, are in the wildland urban interface that are gonna require you to disclose what is the situation around your house with regards to these characteristics around wildfire risk. That raises the awareness but also necessitates the need because I realize as a seller, oh, that's gonna impact my price and be able to get for my for my home because I'm passing on that awareness around these things that could be issues. So, you know, I, it's the challenge is it is so complex, right? And there's these systems at play, um, but it comes back to that, that education piece. Tim, same question, except this time, instead of outside in, inside out, how are you having these conversations with your clients about sustainable design, wellness, and how it all ties together? <clears throat> we start at the very beginning. Um, they know it, because they were re referred to us in some way, they know what we do. Uh, most of our work is tradition-based, um, so we are constantly looking for precedent, and there's a lot of precedent in the way uh, we used to use water, or the way we used to use electricity 100 years ago. Um, so sometimes we'll refer to some earlier way of doing things, some precedent, but um, often, um, because there are so many new materials which are sustainable and so many new products which actually do the work, um, we, we always lead our presentations with those. Sometimes there'll be things that are less um, sustainable in our presentations and sometimes our clients really go for that and sometimes we have to twist their arm or, be, or advocate for a better solution but we always lead with what we think is the right choice. I think we do that because we can, because it's within our grasp. But there are so many things which are also within our grasp that we don't. I'm talking about policy. You, you watch the electric uh, fight from incandescent to mandating fluorescent to mandating LED. Why are we not doing something similar with our water resources? Why are not we charging more when you're over a certain gallon per person per household? You know, why are we not 
uh, why is there not policy for what we what trees we tear down or how how we use our lawns or what, what factories which are high water consumption in Southern California maybe should be invited to go elsewhere and what should be attracted here we have the ability as as individual people as architects landscape designers any one of our creative trades has the opportunity to advocate in some way to write your congressman to uh, get on a committee to to rip up asphalt play yards with three people that's what they're doing this month so we have a we can lead with what we have our hands on and that could be materials and that could be shaded design so that we cut our heat load on our houses um, that could be everything to do with insulation or uh, passive systems making sure we ventilate without using air conditioning but that's just what we can put our hands on and I think we're smart enough and and connected enough that we can do more than that it, it lead back to this idea of water reclamation because I think it <clears throat> it's one of those examples where I, I can I can tell you firsthand at the start you know you were talking about how long you've had your system I looked into this when we were in Manhattan Beach and here's what was really interesting um, it was that that pilot program where you could take one outlet and do it without pulling permits or doing anything and the city of Manhattan Beach was just aghast by that whole concept They're like wait no wait a minute they really were caught off guard and does that surprise you that you still have, I mean, I should, I'm not asking that question I answer that. <laughs> it is so surprising that municipalities are still not on board with this when it is for the, the betterment and benefit of the entire community where where do we where do we begin to fix that idea? Is it with the municipalities or with the residents realizing that they can save money, that it can it can be better for them in the in the short and long term? I tend to think it starts with the residents, and uh, you can mandate things. The city of LA now requires new cons new residential construction to be dual plumbed in preparation for gray water. So if you have a house on a slab, instead of one pipe coming out that's combined gray water black water. There's going to be two pipes, a gray water pipe and a black water. You don't need to install a gray water system, but you need to at least prepare for the future. So that's great. But I think this stuff comes from individuals' desires to do right in the world, or at least the systems that work better are driven by, not by top-down mandating, but by uh, individual response and the desire to do right in the world. Uh, I think a lot of the plumbing code was written by sanitary engineers. Uh, historically, wastewater has been a source of use. Um, so, you know, a hundred years ago, you needed to be very careful to separate these things. But nowadays, it's becoming clear that, similar to a hundred years ago, when you throw out all your glass and aluminum and everything else, because the same garbage can, it makes much more sense to separate these things. So, instead of a black can, we now have a black can, a green can, and a uh, blue can for recyclables. Water's the same way. It's not all the same. You don't have to all flush it down the toilet and go out to the um, uh, sewage treatment plant. Uh, it can be separated, ideally kept separate, and used in the most appropriate way possible, which is, in general, get it back into the land around your house. It, it's, it's interesting, too, because as we're, as we're talking about these examples, you know what it reminds me of? It rem does anyone remember um, did you ever see the movie Who Killed the Electric Car with Ed Begley Jr. and, and uh, it was so interesting because we talk about our Teslas now like, oh my gosh, it's so new and it's amazing and Tesla's amazing for doing what they did. Well, GM like created the perfect car in the 80s, right? And their model was they were gonna rent it out, not sell it. And when they realized how successful the program was, they recalled them all and destroyed them because they realize that if people only buy a car once every 20 years, that it's gonna be bad for the industry. Do we have a similar situation in our industry right now? And that's open, whoever wants to take that. I, I, were you gonna say something? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I was actually thinking about this while um, Lee and Tim were talking, but I think that um, I, I imagine Los Angeles so much different than it actually is. Um, <laughs> where instead of some streets tree-lined, all streets, no matter where you are in Los Angeles, are tree-lined. And I think that imbalance and inequity 
is across the board. And so what you have is you have people that don't have any contact with an open space or nature and, and then don't even realize maybe there is education to be had or a job to be gotten or a career to have. And I think what I see happening in my industry is just a vanishing awareness that landscaping is a craft and that not only is it a craft, but it's a way to save the world. And, and so, um, yeah, that's, that's my answer to that. And if I could just build on what she said a little bit, I, you know, I think a lot of what we've been talking about here, we have the luxury to make these decisions, to make to make these choices, and, and I think to, to Cassie's point, that's the hard part, right? We need to figure out these solutions that can create a better environment for everyone, and tree equity is a, is a great measure of, of what's happened in our city for decades, if not longer, uh, and these things, again, have these ripple impacts. You know, areas where there's less trees, there's less of that connection to nature, there's less of that connection for, for your own mental health, it's also their higher heat, right? There's lower property bills, there's all these ripple impacts, and so, you know, I think it's important for us to lead in the places where we do have the capital and resources and the luxury of making a decision because we think it's the right thing to do. Uh, but we need to figure out how do we create this bridge to bring everyone with us. So, you know, it comes back, you know, to your question of like, you know, who killed the who killed the electric car? Um, I think we unfortunately don't have that luxury to to wait anymore. I think that's what's changed about where we're at now. And I also think coming back to just simple economics, people have realized, wait, we can make money in this transition as well. I think that's important, right? It's a part of how our society works. I'm, a, I'm an econ major from undergrad, and, and for better or for worse, um, that's that's how our, our, our economy functions. And people are realizing, like, wait a minute, if we can put these systems in place, that reduces our long-term need for spending. We can reduce our long-term utility costs. We can improve our health and reduce our long-term health costs on the system. So, you know, if we look long-term and we don't look so present, these things can make a lot of economic sense and actually make us more money and create a more sustainable situation long-term. Here are two conundra. Um, overhead power lines were put into Los Angeles in the teens and 20s when we first became a municipality. There are so many other ways to run power, not overhead. But we don't plant trees on streets that have overhead power lines because they would conflict with the power lines and cause an outage or a fire. So we have all of these tree-lined streets with no power lines, but those streets that have power lines can't have trees. That's who killed the electric car. I mean, we could make a different decision, and then we could plant trees, and they wouldn't be at odds. Um, we, uh, uh, there's an underground river that comes down La Cienega. Uh, I did some consulting on the Center for Early Living at the corner of Melrose and La Cienega once. In the bottom of their parking uh, tower, they have this giant catch basin where, where hundreds of foot acres of water pass through every day and they pump it into the storm, system, storm sewer because that's a private property, but it's, so it's considered a private problem. Instead of working with the city of, I, I think it's West Hollywood or LA, but um, working with the city to take that water and pump it into uh, a, a tanks that, that irrigate public parks or some other purpose, but because it's a public-private conundrum, um, they have to pump it back up into the storm sewer. We have, that's, those are two examples. There are hundreds of who killed the electric cars regarding water in Los Angeles or power. I'll mention another conundrum of LA that's always struck me. Two of the defining infrastructures of Southern California are the aqueduct system that wends its way down through the state, uh, bringing water to LA, this massive thing that's like 60 feet wide, and the LA River that is designed to as efficiently and swiftly remove water from the city of LA and send it out to the ocean when it rains. So you've just got these two things that are really at odds with each other. Yeah. And waste. Excuse me, yeah. can I? I live across the street. Have any of you ever been to Parco Brea? Mm -hmm. Okay, 80 years old, right? We're now putting the water system in that you're talking about. They were just out starting it the other day. Those trees were planted 80 years ago park setting. It's fascinating because so few people know about really 100 acres, 11,000 people right over there, and it works. It works. And it was planned 80 years ago. And if you think about how that and the original farmer's market, that was it around here. Mm -hmm. And then the rest was all 
farmland and orange groves and all. So it's it's really since then when this big buildup. I'm from here, so I I can say that they really had they they had their idea how it was going to be built and it worked. And if others would just even go over and look at it and say, oh my goodness. If they could do that, we can do it. So here's the question I have. Um, just out of curiosity, how many of you, by show of hands, are designers? Okay, architects? And just enthusiasts who are just really interested in the topic? Okay, okay, all right, all right. What I, what I think is, is so fascinating about this, and I love this, so for you who are in, in the bids, right, architects, designers, is it, isn't it interesting that we have cases like that? I mean, look, I have mentioned I'm a native Angelino, grew up in the valley. There were, I was, my first house was in Tarzana. There were orange groves <laughs> across the street. I was, I lived there when the orange groves came down. So I've seen it. I don't mean to date myself, but here's what's interesting. You can look at LA as a microcosm, and if you're in the industry, it, it behooves you and it benefits you to learn from this. You are in a scientific study. My point is, is you know, California is the salad bowl of America, right? And we rely on water. And I know we're, we're kind of heavy on, on water in this conversation, but I think it makes sense because it's just such a perfect example of how everything else ties in together. Air quality is equally as important. Um, you know, the air quality that we have right now, the fact that every home is not gonna have a natural gas outlet, by the way, the people in Oklahoma think we're nuts, <laughs> okay? And it's, it's also Midwest oil and gas country. But I think it's interesting because for the sake of this conversation, you know, California has had to go it alone for so long. Will that, is that gonna continue? Can, can I mention for a moment too, just the state of like where water is at in general. I, I like to look at water and think about where energy was 10, 20 years ago. Some would say maybe even 30 years ago. You know, if you think about energy has moved to a much more decentralized place in terms of having solar, people being aware of energy storage, having energy storage. You know, water needs to be on that same trajectory and it is, it's just far behind. Um, and a lot of this comes back to information flow as well. I think many of us have actually no idea of where the water really goes in our home when we use it. We may know in general, okay, some for irrigation, shower, washing dishes, laundry, but we don't really know how much that is. And I think that's part of the opportunity. We need to get you know, more interface as people with our, ener with our water use, just like has happened around energy use, and being more cognizant of, okay, this is actually what my energy use is on a day-to-day -day basis. If I'm getting an EV, oh no, it's gonna go up to here. I have to figure out how to offset that. Um, many of us don't have that, that, that knowledge, and in California in particular, when it comes to water, to your point, um, you know, I come back to how we've been structurally set up. You know, we have 100 years of, of federal projects that have created catchment basins and water storage that none of that is in our cost of what we pay on a day-to-day on -day basis. And you know, we have this agricultural situation here where in the Central Valley, our water table is, is very polluted. You know, in California, I'm, I'm probably not getting the exact number right, but I think about 80% of our water goes to agriculture here in the state. Uh, you know, 20% of it goes to cities. Think about how much, how much of the conversation we've had about us saving water at our homes. How do we save water there? And that's, if we all saved, you know, 30, 40% of our water use for the state, that's only maybe a few percent, right? 11% goes to residential. So let, there we go, thank you. I knew somebody knew these stats better than me. So I think that's something to keep in mind, and, and that comes back to advocacy, as Tim was saying. We need to be advocating for systems to be in place around agriculture. Yes, we need food, but there needs to be a, an intent to uh, use, use recycled water on, in agriculture. There needs to be an intent to measure what's there. And we need to have more awareness. If we all knew where that water was going, we can advocate for it properly. Even on what we plant, like why yeah. are we incentivized to eat almond uh, orchards right. uh, or rice? <laughs> doing that. Why are we doing that in Southern California? Yeah. We could change the way we incentivize. Right. Let, me, let me just sort of switch gears a little bit. Um, because we've been so water heavy, this kind of affects that, but also the fire side of things. Um, our, our homes, you know, right now you feel like you live in LA proper, so you don't have to worry so much about fire directly, but that's not true. Um, 
that's also a big part of what we do. And, and those, those products and materials also tie into air quality, breathability. Talk about that for a little bit. Um, ben, I'm gonna start with you and then we'll go on from there because you seem to be like the, the touch point for, for all things environmentally and sustainably right and just. Well, look, part of why I do this work is because uh, I'm a big believer that the built environment is a place where everything comes together that has these ripple impacts. And I think when we start talking about these other systems, it gets very hard to find tangible ways we can create influence, but we can all create influence through, through the built environment, what we design, what we build, what we maintain, because that connects everything. Coming up to fire for a moment, I think some of the shift in realization is really that, you know, the forest knows how to deal with fire, has had fire forever. Uh, the challenge is, is that we're not setting up our communities and our homes to be able to adapt and embrace when that fire happens and exist through that. You know, we, I think we all heard about the Paradise fire that happened in Northern California. You know, many started to refer to that, that was, that was a house fire that happened to burn some trees in some ways rather than a forest fire that burned homes because Again, it, it comes back to this design basis, and uh, there's an interesting statistic we have in our wildfire toolkit that blows my mind that you know, because the materials have changed so much over the last 20 or 30 years, it used to take something like 14 to 17 minutes for a home to burn. It can take as quickly as, as two to three minutes now for a home to burn because of the materials that are in place. And a lot of that, again, comes back to intentionality and what was specified for those builds, but we can do a lot of things to reduce that risk in our homes by specifying proper materials, by being aware, by looking at design and implementing things that are going to reduce the opportunity for embers to catch and things like that. So, um, you know, this is an important moment, I think, for us to shift that thinking a little bit because it's scary to think, and it is true, I think all of us do have a risk here in LA for fire uh, in an increased way, and I think it, it always seemed like something like, oh, some other community is dealing with that, right? Somebody else, that's not going to affect us here, but that, that's not true, and so we need to take a hard look about how we maintain our homes and the materials we're using. And I'm sure a lot of other folks on this panel have things to say on this, but it's, it's a really important topic right now. Uh, we're releasing a certification for contractors and landscapers this fall uh, to, to half-day workshop where they can learn about these best practices to reduce fire risk. So I'm excited about that. Tim, um, product specification. A couple of questions on that end. Um, I don't know if you've heard, but the supply chain has been a little backed up. <laughs> it's been an issue. Um, then before that, when couldn't go to trade shows because they weren't happening. And even before that, when we were so busy just blowing and going and not really thinking about new product specification because there was always time to do it later, we found out that there wasn't. How has specification, product specification, changed for you? How, how, do you, how has that changed in your process? What do you look for? What are you asking for of your vendors and your showrooms and your your partners, how are you learning about new products? And is are these issues important to you? Yes. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, first, how we learn. Um, I've got six project manager architect teams, um, and every one of our projects is different and in different parts of California and sometimes across the states. Um, so what we do is teach each other, and one project learn something about one material, then we pass it on. We often, uh, we often are challenged, but fortunately we have great collaborators and our landscape designers, our interior designers, and our builders who are constantly giving us suggestions and half the time we're like, <laughs> don't know that. Mm -hmm. So we get on, we do our research, we look for user reviews or we try to find out what the, what, if there are insurance stats on it. So we do some research on a product that we discovered before we actually um, put it out for consideration with the client. The last thing I want to do is, is be a proponent of something that has had three minutes of experience and could just be the next, uh, the next bad thing. So we, we teach each other and our collaborators teach us, but ultimately we've been doing fire resistant building for over 15 years. Um, the materials we choose, and, and I know this is gonna sound tacky to some people, but Many of our roofs look like they're wood, but they're not wood. And many of our shingles look like they're wood, but they're not wood. And in the higher fire zones where I already have, uh, I can't vent the attics, uh, I have to seal out the crawl spaces for, for ember transfer. Uh, we've got uh, sprinklers. Uh, we have all kinds of fire mitigation processes using a material. And if we had the client base that wanted to use it, uh, 
Jetson material on their home, we would probably do that. Most of our clients come to us because of tradition. So we're looking for those materials or the thick exterior members. You can't use anything smaller than, I think, three and a half inches now for an outside piece of wood. So you're constantly learning mostly from our collaborators and then we teach each other. Lee, what's next in the process? And, and, I, I, and I say that because there's never an end to when a, when a process starts to work. And I'll, uh, again, I'll go back to the auto industry. Um, after the electric vehicles, then there was that whole process. Do you remember when people were converting their Mercedes diesels mm -hmm. into biodiesel and going to the, to the restaurants and getting all the, the fry oil and putting it in their car? I did. You did that. <laughs> okay, perfect guy to ask, right? So th that is, that's my question. Um, and by the way, it was, most of us thought it was a little weird, but it smelled great when you went by. It was kind of cool. But that, that led to other technologies that we see being used today. Um, God bless the engineers, right? So what's, what's next as you, as you see it now? Well, Ben mentioned this a few times, is that the cost of water is not reflected in your water bill. The, it's paid for by state funds. And what's next is water is going to have to get more expensive. And once that happens, once water, you know, right now it's about a half cent a gallon, it, should be more like four cents a gallon if you were going to pay for all the stuff that aqueducts and the pumps and this um, uh, storage tanks and all that stuff, you know. Um, so once that happens, things will change. But I think it is going to have to be driven by the designers. I think uh, a lot of architects I talked to tell me like, oh well, we you know we talked about gray water in the early days, and then the discussion kind of just petered out. Well, I think it is becoming increasingly unsustainable uh, or irresponsible for designers to put together a house to design it for their clients or a landscape without considering the greater picture of where that water is going to come from to irrigate the garden, how their waste is going to get used, um, solar panels. These are all distributed systems. and. Ultimately, they're going to lead to a much more resilient community if you can imagine a house that produces its own water for irrigation and generates its own electricity and has storage tanks for uh, potential, you know, like rainwater systems. These are, that's what happened in Australia after 10 years of drought. They all, everyone's got a thousand gallon tank and it is a very resilient, self-sufficient community. And I'll bet you people know how much they use out of those thousand gallon right. tanks. Well, you become <laughs> much more attuned to your consumption. Right. If it's all going down the drain, you have no idea. But if you're putting it back in your land, you are much more aware of what products you're using and how much you have and how much you're consuming. Can I just make one comment about what you were just saying is vitally important. But, this is the big but, have you talked to, to people in the city, in the, in the, you know, trying to get permits to do this, do that, and do the other? I mean, I gave up on trying to get a grey water system uh, for a house that I built on my home drive, and we still don't have, we still don't have it, and we're still not pumping it to the, up to the road, which is what they wanted us to do. And I said, absolutely not. I'm never going to pump extra water that I'm going to put on the garden. But it's still, it's, it, it, at the moment, it's not, it, it's not. It's not permitted. Same thing with the house I'm building myself for our for our garden. To, and they, I cannot. All they want me to do is to take the rainwater and pump it into a, a, a tank and then pump it up to the road. I mean, I I will not do it. But if I don't do it, they won't give me final. So I need somebody's help to can you figure out can where you we go. Can you make a call? <laughs> well, can I, can I comment yeah, yeah, yeah. on yeah. the what the what's next? And I think that the comment that we're hearing is it really leads to that and, and I think that it's the intersection between sustainability and uh, for instance home hardening. There's there's such a disconnect there and I think when there's a disconnect there then you also have the disconnect with the municipality and the codes. And, and I think bringing these things together is really what's next or we're not going to have the, the synergies that are absolutely necessary to be successful in protecting our homes from wildfire 
um, nor will we have the trees to protect our homes uh, from you know using too much energy and also wildfire. And uh, and, and just a personal note, um, I was really happy to hear when the wildfire topic came up today that the focus was the home because home gardening is number one. And for so much of my career, um, the landscape has been the, the villain in this. And now we know that the landscape is, is added defense against a very well hardened home. You know, I love that you're bringing that up. And again, you know, if you look around the showroom, you can see that some products were labeled uh, fire and, and water specifically for those reasons where, you know, where decking would be the first thing that would, that would go up. You know, now these fire retardant materials um, for both inside and out, I think is is crucially important. Lee, any any th final thoughts on that particular subject? Well, I think I mean the main problem of fire is based in the lack of water. So uh, that's you know uh, solves the water crisis and maybe you'll start solving. I want to transition just a little bit because the trend that I've seen. We're talking about what's next, right? And one of the trends that I've seen is um, back to this idea of Su supply chain specifically as it relates to food product, right? And one of the things, and, and you know, God bless the hippies again back on Laurel Canyon in the 1970s who were growing weed, trying to do it with the least amount of water and energy that they possibly could, right? I mean, if you think about it, that is kind of like we're going back to that idea as it relates to, to microgreens, herbs, indoor gardening. I, I, I'm seeing this um, as, a, as a trend that's you know, it, start, it started in areas like Hawaii where, you know, for need, you know, but now it's gaining more and more popularity. Are you seeing that as well, the inside out as it relates to the gardening? Um, um, I, I'm definitely, I mean, we all know that, um, you know, having more plants around you has a number of benefits on your health and uh, wellness. So I, I definitely am seeing way more indoor foliage, not as much food, sort of food foliage. But definitely, I think that that is a trend that is is changing. Um, I think, you know, some of the challenges are light, you know, in, in an indoor environment. And so maybe that when we speak to the architects about the light. <laughs> we have a, a accelerator for startups in the built environment, and uh, we've definitely seen an increase of solutions to help bring more biophilia into the environment. They can be modular. They can plug in. Uh, we actually have a great company in the program right now uh, called Leapfrog that actually has a gray water system that's also a planter that can bolt onto a house and they can grow food and it's modular so you can attach them based on the volume. So are you saying gray water so going out and then coming right back in or actually staying within the house and not leaving? The gray water is going to irrigate these, these built-in built boxes outside. to grow food yeah, in, a, in a connected way outside. But, but not bringing it back inside. But not bringing it back in. Although you could, you could plumb it that way, I suppose. If you, if you wanted to, you could put the units wherever you wanted. Uh, and but we are seeing those units, and, and I don't know if other folks here like I have a lettuce grow tower at home. I don't know if anyone has those, which are um, you know it's essentially a hydroponic tower to grow food in. Um, I during the pandemic I doubled the number of slots I have there, and I get almost all my greens from that. And so I think it comes back to that distributed. You know, it's, it's, it's again it's that distributed taking ownership for ourselves. I think there was sort of this trend for decades here. You know, it's, everything's about big systems. You know, it's the '80s. Let's just build it all, right? And uh, now we're realizing we have to take more ownership for that, right? And it comes back to, you know, growing our own food. It's, it's getting those distributed systems in place because of the challenge of reliability. And so I think that trend will continue across everything. Uh, and it even comes back to the point of like, how do we put more groundwater right into our table? Like, I need to take responsibility for the water that's on my property, putting that back in the ground table. I need to take responsibility and ownership for controlling my own food. And I just want, and Tim, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this back to you in a minute, but I, I think mentioning that is, is really important. And the reason why is, it again, it's not about the responsibility of it per se, but, you know, if, if, a, if an average outdoor tree is, is soaking up and drinking 200 gallons of water a day, if you're putting the groundwater, if you're replacing the groundwater, which is critically important to your foundation, it's, it's a benefit to you. It's saving, it's saving your structure over the long term. We don't do uh, we don't design houses to have indoor um, edible gardens, but edible gardens are really good outside. For the inside, I think because your your, your constraints are so tight, there's a there are a lot of plant material that survives super well inside. But for the outside, even in, even in the middle of paradise here, you have microclimates in your yard, 
and some parts of your yard are drier or shadier or hotter. So if you're making, uh, we, we encourage our clients to have edible gardens all the way around. So whether it's citrus or pomegranate, or it's tomatoes and hot peppers, there are things that grow super well with very little water, and they don't always look nasty in October when, when the, everything dries up. If you mix them in with other things, or if you plant herbs that are drought tolerant, like oregano or sage or, or rosemary, as opposed to, you know, I can't grow basil to save myself. Um, but finding things that fit your water path and your climate path in every one of the houses, whether you're at the beach or you're up in the top of the Mulholland Hills, I think there's, there's a way to tailor your edible garden and find some way to niche it into your landscape um, super easy. A laundry to landscape system that collects water from the washing machine can be installed without a permit, without inspection. Uh, my company sometimes teaches workshops on to homeowners so they can learn how to do this themselves. And it could, you know, one person living alone could support a lemon tree and an avocado tree. It's going to provide shade, it's going to provide food. You can combine them and make guacamole. Uh, <laughs> it used to be lemonade, now it's guacamole. It's a very oh, lemony yeah. guacamole. <laughs> uh, and it, it's just going to go back to the land. So um, there are simple things you can do like that. Is it, okay, is it okay to dream? Yeah. Dream. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, when you think, when you talk about, you know, taking ownership over growing some food, a little bit of food, I think about sort of all the topics that we've been talking about, water, food, fire, and I do feel that a lot of the time you're really only as safe and healthy as your neighbor is. You're, you're vulnerable, your home's vulnerable if your neighbor has palm trees that aren't being husked or pine trees that aren't being watered. But the dream could be that neighborhoods or blocks worth of homes work together to coordinate food growth create fire safe councils that get funding to do home hardening projects um, that you know, work together to you know, get some of the, the grants that are available for communities and start to work together as a resilience hub and have that responsibility and ownership over their own resources more and more. And you don't need to go door to door and have a neighborhood block party to get that accomplished. We're in the in the era of social media. We can talk with each other, or organize movements without having a, a committee meeting at somebody's house after dinner, as my parents would have done. I think, to to your point, that's that's how we would address an urban planning or a building and safety issue. If people, if enough people are in some sort of a chat room to decide to uh, make a presentation or to advocate for or sit on a committee, I think we have this now, this super easy, almost free ability to gather and to create ways to get grants from the government for things which would affect, sure, us, but our entire block or a stretch of blocks. Because we have that, we're not good at doing that yet, and maybe we feel a little shy about it, but this is a crisis. So time is up, I think, to be shy about it. We can find ways to reach out and create these groups that will give us the incentives and the policy and the resources we don't even know about yet. Um, and that is a great final word, unless Ben dare to dream? Anything? I, I always dare to dream. I mean, I, you know, what strikes me about what Cassie was saying is that, um, first of all, having this vision is important, but again, it just comes back to kind of being human. What we're describing is the village, right? It's a return to, to having a community where people care for each other, they're aware of each other, and I think as human beings we tend to overcomplicate things. Uh, it's as simple as just having that connection, right? And you know, I've worked on projects. I'm sure Cassie has, and other people here, where you, you, you know, when you see kids garden for the first time and you see them connect with that plant growing and realize, oh wait, I can get food from this. That's a lifelong connection. And uh, same thing when you see people get out into a you know, native environment here and be surrounded by plants and realize that oh, I feel better, I feel healthier. You know, we need to, to bring back those connections. And you know, coming back to the personal responsibility, my, my dream is that we all are intentional about taking that time to create that connection with each other and that connection with nature. And I, that will, over time, I think, heal, heal all of us, right? And that's reflected in our built environments and reflected in so many other things in society. So that's my, that's my dream. Love that. <laughs> um, any thoughts? Oh, question, yeah. Well, no, it's more that this is exciting. Do you know who Ron Finley is? I'm sure you do. The gangster gardener. And do you know who he is? No. 
Oh, well, they do. Okay. So he's wonderful, right? Yeah. He came up with an idea. He took it to the city, and he took all of the parkways in front of houses down in parts of LA that don't even have a market. And he's planted fruit trees and vegetable gardens and it's just fabulous. And of course, the best part is he got the city to come up with the water for out there. So you should connect with Ron Finley and find out what he did. We are making things Who happen. He, no, seriously. I mean, am I right? Can you fill in more about Ron? Um, I read about his work like 15 years ago when he started taking over these parkways, and it was, um, it was mind blowing that. Uh, People didn't even know what a parkway Google was, it. or that Google they could him. actually that they actually were responsible for that little spit of land, and they could do what they wanted. Um, so he really um, and looks how it's grown now. If yeah. there's a little bit of room, and somebody has in their backyard, they'll share it with their other neighbors. Some fences are coming down between these old houses, so that they can have bigger gardeners, gardens. Yeah. That's amazing. Park La Brea can is get, opening another garden. Can we get yeah. to talk to that building that's to pumping the water up? That's <laughs> that happens a lot over LA, by the way. That issue you mentioned about the groundwater seepage, it's a, yeah. it's a big deal in a lot of areas. Yeah. We yeah. should be having We that. had a question over here. Um, it's a curiosity for me. So I just did a piece on induction. And what was curious to me about when I was doing research and talking to people was that so many people did not realize, for example, that induct like how fast it was, how easy it was, it didn't generate heat, you're going to use less air conditioning as a result, it was much healthier because the, it, the air didn't, whatever, but it was crazy how many, at the same time that I was writing this article, I had a lot of friends who were in the process of buying new appliances. And I was like, you have to go buy an induction. That doesn't work. Just like all these things, and so many people are just afraid of, of different technologies or the fact that it's, it's going to be so expensive or, you know, be, you know, think about the long term costs or the long term totally. effects of it. And it's true. I think a lot of it has to do with people are just really entrenched in their old ways of doing things. Yep. First, I just want to say, great job, all of you. Um, I, love, I love this topic, everything that you covered. in El Decor feature sustainability or water reclamation. Yeah. So if that's where our market is getting their information, yeah. why don't we put it in front of them? Yeah. Right. I just want to mention, you talked about the, the economic aspects of this. One of the questions I get is people will say, well, what is the return on investment? Like how long will it take to pay off this system? And so maybe it's a $10,000 system that's going to you know, and the answer to that question is decades or maybe even never. But how long is your 
granite countertop, what's the return on investment on that? It's infinite. It does not generate anything. It does not do anything for the environment. It has been milled and extracted and placed in your kitchen, and then it sits there um, not saving any water or power. But it brings anything. you joy. <laughs> <laughs> so you can also buy a $10,000 uh, carved stone bathtub, but are you going to enjoy taking a bath in that tub knowing the water is going to get wasted? Won't <laughs> well, you love it so much more if you know that you're taking a responsible bath? I'd also like to respond with a, maybe an, an idea. I, yeah. I think that um, if you now USGBCLA is a nonprofit and it's a large organization that covers LA, but what I would advise for experts that really want to make change is to find the community organization that is is really um, that you're passionate about, that's doing things that are either in line with your career or with your passion, and join those community organizations and bring your expertise, bring your resources, and help them spread the word because these are really the ambassadors in your community that are making change. And it's very, very hard to do this alone as a, a, a professional. You know, I have a company of 35 people, I'm very busy, but when I join USUBCLA, or the Theodore Payne Foundation, or the Niles Foundation, or whatever, that's where the change happens. And that's where the momentum, that's where you can grab onto the things that create momentum. So in the, in the effort of time, in the, in the effort to save time, because you've all contracted with us for, a, for an hour, and we've got, kind of gone over that, but thank you. Um, thank you this is, yeah, this is a great conversation. And I think the answer is, we just do more of these. Um, we do more of these and further the conversation if we can. So if you like this conversation, I hope you do, um, make sure you're subscribing to Doctoring Up Design, which is the official podcast of Design Hardware. By the way, Avi, thank you for having us. Um, thank you very much. Um, Michelle, thank you for putting together such a remarkable idea. And again, I would... throw one thing out. What can we do as a material provider to help join we can send an email blast, but we're going to be sending it to you. We're going to, to our clients, architects, designers. Uh, maybe we offer to pay their vendors. Or even make, or make space something. for the conversation. We, we, I, you know, I just want to build on the comment you made. You know, it's, it's important we have these events. I go to a lot of these events. I'm a big believer it's about what happens between the events. Mm -hmm. uh, because you know, we can go to events all day, and that's important. That's part of the awareness and the education. But it comes back to that responsibility and the organizing and getting involved because you can make a difference. So making that own commitment on yourself to either share what you learned here, you know, make that just a small commitment or get involved somehow. That means when we come together at the next event, we talk about this again, we can all share what we've done that's positive since then. And appreciate your offer very much. Yeah. And we'll figure it out. We'll yeah. do something. It all works together. Yeah, and if anyone needs to know how to subscribe to a podcast, I can help you out. And please, um, we're, we're gonna, our guests are going to stick around for a little while. Thank you guys for doing this. If you have, if you have any more questions, please come on up, introduce yourselves. Thanks again for coming. Thank you.